Thank you for joining this session. I'll be speaking on radiographic assessment of cervical deformity. These are my disclosures. None of these are directly relevant to this presentation. The cervical region is the most flexible portion of the spine. The deformities that affect the cervical spine are complex and can have significant impact on the patients. However, the literature on cervical deformity remains relatively limited. One of the early studies we did through the ISSG on cervical deformity was to look at the impact of this disease on the patients. We, we looked at the baseline EQ5D scores for patients coming in for surgery, and we compared these with US normative and other chronic disease state values. We found that adult cervical deformity patients were highly impacted by their disease. Their baseline EQ5D scores were comparable to those of the bottom 25th percentile for heart failure, stroke, renal failure, emphysema, and blindness. We also showed that surgery has the potential to provide significant improvement for cervical deformity patients. We showed this across a number of patient reported outcomes measures, including pain and disability measures. But what is cervical deformity? Certainly they're the readily apparent cases, the patients that come in with chin on chest deformity or severe scoliosis, but how is it objectively defined? It's not simple enough to say that any kyphosis equals cervical deformity. In this study from Obeid and colleagues, they looked at 230 asymptomatic subjects and found that up to one third of them had a straight or a kyphotic spine. Hardiker and colleagues published normative values for cervical alignment back in 1997, but they did not take into account the rest of the, cervical, or the, rest of the spinal alignment, including thoracal, lumbar, and pelvic alignment. Subsequently, in a study led by Chris Ames in collaboration with the ISSG and AO North America, we looked at 55 asymptomatic volunteers using long cassette x-rays. We found that normal cervical alignment varies significantly by age. We also found that there's a significant chain of correlations that extends from the pelvis up to the head, which emphasizes the need to take into account the alignment of the rest of the spine and the pelvis when looking at significant cervical alignment deformities. Can a classification help define cervical deformity, focus radiographic assessment, and perhaps guide surgical planning? We set out with these questions a number of years ago in the ISSG, and we wanted to develop a classification system for cervical deformity, and we relied on a modified Delphi approach at the time because the literature was very limited. This is the classification that we published. Uh, it includes a simple deformity descriptor and five modifiers. The cervical deformity descriptor includes C, CT, and T uh, for the kyphoses that have apex in the mid-cervical, cervical thoracic junction, and thoracic spine respectively. S reflects those that have a primary scoliosis, and CBJ is for the primary craniovertebral junction deformities. The first modifier was the C2 to C7 sagittal vertical axis, or SVA. And this was one of the few parameters that actually had literature to support it. And this is from a study led by Chris Ames, in which we showed that there's a linear correlation of NDI, or neck disability index, and that C2 to C7 SVA. The threshold was at about 40 millimeters uh, for a moderate degree of disability based on NDI. For sagittal imbalance, perhaps prevention is the best treatment. Many years ago, a number of lumbar fusions were performed on a Wilson frame, producing flatbacks that required significant uh, deformity corrective surgeries. When we position patients for uh, long segment cervical thoracic fusions, it's important to take into account the alignment so that we don't produce a significant number of patients uh, with uh, sagittal, uh, cervical sagittal imbalance. The second modifier was the horizontal gaze modifier. The ability to maintain horizontal gaze is a very basic human function. At the time, normal values for chin, brow, vertical, angle were not rigorously defined, and so we had to use a Delphi approach in order to determine thresholds for this modifier. 
Sook and colleagues have shown the significance of chin-brow vertical angle. They looked at 34 patients treated with PSO for kyphotic deformity, and they assessed horizontal gaze function based on the modified arthritis impact measurement scale. They significantly improved the chin-brow vertical angle in their patients from 96 degrees to 17 degrees. They overall left their patients somewhat undercorrected, but despite this, these patients had very good horizontal gaze scores. For those that were undercorrected even by a little bit, they had what's called a bird watcher's position for obvious reasons because they're forced to look in an upright position. Interestingly, the patients that were even a bit overcorrected had significantly worse overall horizontal gaze scores. And these scores were significantly worse, especially for going downstairs for obvious reasons because they weren't able to see their feet in front of them. Sook and colleagues suggested goals for the chin brow to vertical angle to be between approximately minus 10 degrees and plus 10 degrees. Lafage and colleagues subsequently have looked at this in more detail. They, uh, based on looking at a number of, uh, of, of, in, uh, of uh, patients without cervical deformity, showed that a chin brow vertical angle between approximately minus five degrees and plus 18 degrees corresponded to a low to moderate level of disability. They also explored a number of radiographic correlates because a chin brow vertical angle typically requires clinical photos to assess, but by using these radiographic correlates from the skull base, they were able to determine chin brow, they were able to determine horizontal gaze without the need for clinical photos. The next modifier was the cervical lordosis minus T1 slope. Similar to what's used for the pelvic incidence lumbar lordosis relationship, we use the T1 slope as the base and to determine how much cervical lordosis was necessary for that individual. The thresholds we used were determined based on a modified Delphi approach because there was not good literature at the time uh, for normative values. The next modifier was a myelopathy modifier. A number of these patients can have significant spinal cord compromise, either direct compression or stretching. And so we used the modified Japanese Orthopedic Association score, or the MJOA, uh, as, as a modifier for the classification. The, the last modifier, and it was very important, was to include the SRS Schwab thoracal lumbar deformity modifiers. These help to capture thoracal lumbar alignment as well as pelvic alignment, which are important, especially given the significant chain of correlations extending from the cervical spine down to the pelvis. Since the time that we published this classification, there have been a number of studies that have been published that suggest uh, that the, the modifiers selected for the classification are important and that we are along the right lines in, in what we determined in a, on this initial pass of a classification. There also, there's also been refinement of what the threshold should be for a number of these modifiers. But a cervical alignment is really evolving, and I wanted to spend the last few minutes here discussing some evolving concepts in the assessment of cervical alignment. The T1 slope is emerging as a key parameter. This goes back to a study from Knott in, in which they showed that in patients with a T1 slope greater than 25 degrees, that essentially all of them had at least 10 centimeters of positive sagittal imbalance based on the C7 SVA. In another study from Eric Kleinberg and colleagues through the ISSG, we showed that the T1 slope, if greater than about 30 degrees on cervical radiographs, that that indicated the need to perform full-length spine radiographs as as it had a high sensitivity and a fair specificity for other uh, 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 spinal malalignment below the cervical spine. So we can look at three different clinical scenarios based on cervical x-rays. An individual can have a low C2 tilt, but a high T1 slope. Those individuals tend to have deformities in the thoracal lumbar spine, but with good cervical compensation. And you can see in that individual that they actually have a thoracic deformity rather than a cervical deformity. The next scenario is a high C2 tilt and a low T1 slope. In these individuals, the deformity is likely in the cervical region. And you can see that full length spine x-rays were less revealing in this individual as the deformity was confined to the cervical spine. The third scenario is a high C2 tilt and a high T1 slope. 
In these individuals, they may have deformities in the cervical spine as well as in the thoracolumbar lumbar spine, and it's important to get full-length x-rays, especially in these patients. Another evolving concept is the T1 pelvic angle, or TPA, and this is measured as a line from T1, vertebral body, the center, down to the center of the femoral heads, and a line from there up to the center of the sacral end plate, and this is the TPA, or T1 pelvic angle. And this helps to capture information on both the SVA and the pelvic tilt in a single measure. This is important because individuals can have a significant sagittal imbalance but have high pelvic tilt or correction for this and it may mask a high SVA. So in this study, again led by Themi Protopsaltis, they showed that if the TPA was greater than 20 degrees, these individuals had significant SVA and pelvic tilt abnormalities. For example, in this individual here with three different scenarios of pelvic retroversion, you can see that a high SVA is noted in the situation where the patient isn't retroverting their pelvis, but if the individual really retroverts their pelvis, they can have a normal SVA. But if we look at the TPA, in this individual, in all three scenarios, the TPA remains the same. And so this is an assessment of global sagittal malalignment that isn't uh, compromised by the patient's retroverting of their pelvis. The CTPA has emerged from the TPA. You can see in this individual with a cervical sagittal imbalance, when the patient retroverts their pelvis, that C, uh, C7 plumb line becomes normal. So it really is masking a significant cervical sagittal malalignment by retroverting the pelvis. With the CTPA though, which is the angle from a line extending from C2 down to the femoral heads and then up to T1, you can see that that remains the same in all three scenarios in which the patient is retroverting their pelvis. Interestingly, the CTPA and the TPA in combination can help to determine the location of deformity. For example, in this individual here, where the CTPA is high, but the TPA is normal, the individual has a cervical deformity. And when this, the opposite scenario, this individual has a, a thoracic deformity and has a normal CTPA. And the third scenario in which the CTPA and the TPA are abnormal, the individual likely has a, a deformity in, in the cervical region as well as in the thoracal lumbar region. So in summary, cervical deformity can have significant impact on health-related quality of life. The cervical alignment thresholds, though, for deformity, they're not as well defined as they are for thoracal lumbar alignment, but they're catching up. The first generation ISSG cervical deformity classification appears to be a good first start as a guide to help define treatment goals. And you can see these goals here listed. Certainly this is evolving, and as we learn more about cervical deformity, other parameters may be added, and there may be further, realign, uh, further refinement of the uh, uh, goals for those measures, but this appears to be a good first start. Thank you for your attention to this session. Uh, so the, there's a recent book that's come out through TEMA on cervical spine deformity, and I would direct your attention to that if you want to learn more about these concepts. Thank you.